good afternoon ladies and gentlemen the first uh, talk was about introduction to artificial intelligence this was to be taken by our president who's uh, busy elsewhere so you know on his behalf i will be talking about the introduction and uh, uh, you know introduction to artificial intelligence big data the the optics of big data the ai techniques that we are using in ophthalmology that is the lab. i'm i'm what i'm doing is i'm clubbing the first and the last and the techniques that we are using so we'll be going back and forth in the the topics as they are listed in the instruction course now i do not have any financial disclosures to make in this presentation <clears throat> The first thing that comes to mind is what is artificial intelligence? It has variously been described as the ability of a digital machine or a computer to do things which hitherto required human intelligence. And uh, the best test for it was given by a gentleman called Alan Turing. He said that if you're talking to a machine and you're not able to make out whether it is a machine or it is a human being, then that is artificial intelligence that has already been surpassed. And now we, in this age of driverless cars and and uh, you know, if you, if those who bought this also bought that, that kind of suggestions. So we are repeatedly shifting the paradigm of artificial intelligence. Whatever we could, we could, we could do earlier is now becoming more and more possible for a machine to do. What happened? The first, the first uh, big pillar to fall was Gary Kasparov got defeated by Deep Blue, and you know, once. The world champion was defeated in a game of chess. That's when the interest arose. Then it went a step further. There was another game called Go. It was a strategy game. People used to spend life, entire lifetimes to master that game. And uh, Go was mastered by the system over a period of a couple of months. And then a heuristic. Uh, analysis was done, a heuristic uh, algorithmic learning was done, we just gave it the rules and it iteratively taught itself and it that version was called Alpha Go Zero and that defeated the, the trained uh, experts and what was interesting was that the positions it would take were intuitively incorrect. That means what we believed would be a losing position, the machine was able to convert it into a winning position. That means it created data points which human intelligence would not have created. Now, when we talk of artificial intelligence, there are many ways of defining it. We are today in the era of what is called artificial narrow intelligence. Now, what that means is if a machine is trained in playing chess, it will iteratively improve itself in playing chess and become and, and manage to beat all kind of human beings in that particular game. If it is able to transfer this intelligence from whatever it has learned from say chess into another field of domain or into another area, whether it is say playing cricket or it is uh, performing surgery, then it would be artificial gen general intelligence. And we have not reached that stage as yet. In a few years, maybe we will. And then of course, as the distant utopia or dystopia where machines would iteratively uh, improve themselves and learn and live according to an ecosystem of their own. That's your Tron legacy or whatever you want to call it. Now, when you divide the narrow artificial intelligence, that is the era in which we exist, they can broadly be divided into these ones, robotics, planning, machine perception, knowledge engineering, and machine learning. Now, machine learning is, it includes, you know, supervised learning where you label the, the, the thing, where what, what has been done in dioptic retinopathy and all. We are all labeling those and then the machine just picks it up and says, okay, this looks like, uh, uh, this look like, it looks like an aneurysm. They, these are the parameters which have been given. So it is most likely this. So that is supervised learning. And in unsupervised learning, what it does is it creates, we just, uh, the data is not labeled. It iteratively, it will go back, it will look at the rules or it will look at the data, make clusters, then draw rules from those clusters and separate the groups that are there, right? And then of course, if it does both of them together, then it, that is deep learning. Now, how does that happen in medicine? You see, whenever any patient comes to you, 
he or she gets a prescription. So in effect, what, what is happening is a transaction is taking place. A transaction in, in uh, information technology is whenever data is either created or it is modified in a system. So when he comes to you, you give him a prescription, a, a prescription is created, data is created. Next time he comes, you change the prescription, now data gets modified. So basically a lot of transactions will take place. And then I will take you back to what we used to do in the past. We used to log into a system and then you know we would we would put this data into the computer and <coughs> from that local computer through a network it would go and reside on something like a, a, a centralized computer which was a server, right? And from the server, in the server how was it lying? It was lying in the form of Excel sheets or database files, right? This was when it started. Then came images, then came videos, right? And we started using different type of data, data schema. And we started using file FTP servers. Now this, this is what we are using today. Oh, everybody, all computers, all of us who are using computers. When this, when it is on a server, you cannot do very big analysis on it because the computer will crash or it will not you know, uh, perform the request that the other people are asking for it to perform. So what, if you want to convert this into an algorithm, you are going to take the data which is on your server and put it in another computer or another network of computers and that is called warehouse and that a data warehouse. And now data warehouses in the last decade have come up in a big way in ophthalmology. And in the data warehouse, we are going to perform different type of analysis on it. So basically on whatever was lying on your server is cleaned, it is prepared and then it is put on a, on, on, on in the data warehouse where you run different type of data mining tools and that will give you different type of algorithms. And these algorithms you deploy on live servers and when you feed the data, then the live server tells you, okay, you know, this machine, those who bought this also bought that. So it was calculated on, on the, not on the live server, it was calculated at the backend and now it is being used uh, on the server to help predictive analysis for the client, for the customer. Same thing is happening in ophthalmology also. Now the question arises, why all of a sudden, you know, in the last 10 years or 15 years, we've started talking so much about artificial intelligence, uh, of the uh, teleophthalmology. Now look at this. <coughs> you captured some images, you put it on a server, right? Now anybody can take it from the server and answer this question here. So this becomes the store and forward model of teleophthalmology. So teleophthalmology had one system was very resource intensive. You would have video conferencing, patient would be seen, you would be talking to him, required a huge bandwidth. The other was this model. And this model works in resource constrained environments. And that is why teleophthalmology suddenly comes of age the moment we have a larger bandwidth. Now what has happened? Lot of data is getting generated because of, you know, Diagnostic uh, imaging, mass screening, electrodiagnosis, genomic analysis, our OT notes, our clinical data, all that is getting generated. It is getting recorded electronically in EHR, EMR, PHR, whatever you want to call it. And at the same time, it is also coming from things like what you are wearing, your wearable devices, what you are buying, what transactions you're doing, your demographic data, your uh, health records, and all that can be used to get a big picture of the person. So instead of, you know, prescribing a medicine to an age group or a set of persons in a geographic location, now it is possible to talk in terms of personalized medicine where we can tailor the condition, the, the treatment according to your even genomic analysis. That is what we will be coming to maybe in a few years from now. So personalized medicine is going to happen because 
lot of data is getting stored the cost of storing data is coming down exponentially and we are having bigger and more powerful machines which are able to crunch these numbers in a big way now this brings us to the concept of big data earlier we talked of data which was residing in excel sheets now what has happened is we've talked of so many types of data which is available and when you want to integrate it when you are looking at at uh, you know five different type of uh, uh, imaging modalities you, you you're probably looking at topography you, you're, look, you're looking at an ffa you're looking at an oct and you are manually integrating all that now what has happened is all this data is stored so we when this is stored in a manner that it cannot be stored in traditional data formats then we call it big data big data is something which is very large volume which is very diverse different types of uh, of uh, investigations different type of parameters are there it is coming in very quickly running into petabytes and we've added in medicine two things veracity how accurate it is and how valuable it is so when it satisfies these then it is called big data and big data cannot be analyzed using the traditional statistical methodology techniques that we were using so when we talked of uh, you know data warehouse the first data warehouse that were that that we can talk of was something called the smart eye database which was a web based ophthalmologic data warehouse and uh, what it was doing was basically the university's own uh, uh, ehr was used and it could create cohorts for you to decide ki aapne kisi koi treatment parameters ya kuch check karne hai to it could create cohorts and give you sets of lists which you would retrieve then of course in 2014 american academy developed the iris and this was this took 60 million patients data on 50 quality control measures and 22 outcome measures and the outcome one of the interesting results from this was a study by cantrell et al and they reported that you see in newly diagnosed macular edema the majority of eyes did not get anti vegf treatment in the first 28 days and this was america when everybody was talking that within first 28 days you have to give it and when they were receiving it it was actually avastin and not ranibizumab so this was this was real world data which we could capture because there were these registries that they had developed now this was the example of a registry from a single country now there is another registry which is across different countries it's frb and it allows the it allows patient switching from one modality of age related macular degeneration going into another one and the outcomes from it so it is it is larger than any um, any trial or any study that we've got and we are waiting for results to come from frb now <coughs> so far as techniques concerned in analyzing that data are concerned there are many techniques we'll we'll just concern us why we are talking of these techniques is because you see everybody will say that you know ting did this and uh, they could analyze this with this much percent uh, sensitivity this much percent specificity it just becomes a list what is more important for us to understand is what was the technique they used and how does it translate into practice for us so what what is very important to understand when artificial intelligence is involved is it should be explainable the algorithm that is used it should be explainable otherwise it becomes black box and the interesting thing was they did a study where they found that it could distinguish between a fox and a dog and the reason why it could distinguish between the fox and dog based on labeled images was there was snow behind the fox right so this is this should not happen with us so that is why explainability is extremely important in all data management and ai techniques used in healthcare the simplest one is of course linear regression linear regression is nothing but y explained in terms of x plus a constant you remember we used to have this xy graph and there used to be a slope the slope would cut a, a, a y at a particular thing at uh, x is 
So that used to be the constant, x is zero, that is the constant, and the slope would give us the graph. Now that is called, the, the simplest of that is if both, if both parameters are, are uh, or multiple parameters are, are continuous, then we can do linear regression, and then there are other types of regression analysis that we do. All of us remember our, our IUL power formulas, and there's one of the most uh, convenient and most commonly used one uses regression analysis. Then there are others which are very interesting. Next one is nearest neighbor analysis. What it does is it, it looks at, you know, K means clustering, it looks at clusters. So what, what you get is a report like this. If R is less than one, that means they, there are different data groups, data points which are clustered together and there would be a difference between this and this. So this mean and this mean can be calculated. If R is zero, that means they are randomly distributed. If it is more than one, then they are dispersed. Not only are they randomly distributed, they are actually having a negative uh, impact on each other. Right, then is of course support vector machine. You have this referable versus non-referable. Now, whenever you are able to classify between, you know, uh, two groups or you want to classify, classify between two groups, what you want to do is you want to draw a line between them. This is called a hyperplane. So what does a support vector machine do? It, it clubs yes this side, no this side and between those data points it wants to draw a straight line which is called a hyperplane which will have a positive offset on one side and a negative offset on the, on the other side. Now this is when they are lying absolutely separate. Sometimes there will be an overlap. Then they go like this. <coughs> There's underfitting, overfitting on curves. Then of course we have uh, decision trees. Decision tree is nothing but a, a, a flow chart where you have, you know, different type of weightages which are assigned to it. For example, it could be, you know, we, we have the best example that is given is the probability analysis is done for any, any action that you take. It could be, say, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.7, 0 0.3 and then next step also has this and this particular input would result in, in a particular type of outcome coming in giving us the, the, uh, the percentage in which we should expect that kind of outcome and that is if it is in a single case then it is a decision tree. If you use lots of decision trees, some of them will be positive, lot of them are negative, you say it is negative. In that case, it is called a random forest. Now, this is a very simplistic description, but there are different algorithms, there are different programs which are written for each of them. And then comes to the big daddy of them all, which is being used left, right and center. That is artificial neural networks, convolutional neural networks, deep neural networks like Google Net, LXNet, VGGNet and CAFE and TensorFlow and there are four more, right? <clears throat> and then of course we have naive bias where the posterior probability does not matter. We've already talked of the types of data involved. Basically what we are doing nowadays is whenever we want to train a model, we take the entire data and 80, 20 or 60, 40, we one part is used to train the data set and one half of the same data is randomly kept aside to test whether whatever we've trained is a valid outcome and is working on, on this. Now this is training and testing data within the data set. When this entire algorithm that we've developed is used on another data set or another population, then it is called generalizability of that data set or that. Now that brings us to the now, this is that when you've generalized the algorithm. Now, last year, a very big thing has happened. Ophthalmology is one of the first branches to develop an algorithm which is US FDA approved. And this is IDXDR. This algorithm is for detection of diabetic retinopathy in offices of non-ophthalmic healthcare practitioners. And the insurance companies are going to give uh, reimbursement for this. So this is a very big step forward. And this runs on, on uh, non-midriatic uh, retinal camera, which stores the images, you click those images, then it puts them on a server, and from the server it tells you what it, whether or not this is referable. So it tells you whether, it, if it is mild diabetic retinopathy, if it is 
then it will rescreen at 12 months. If it is more than mild, then it will refer to an eye care professional. And why did they stop at this? There were four studies that were going on. One of them had good positive and negative. Uh, all, of, all, these, all these algorithms had very good negative predictive value, but the positive predictive value was a little iffy. So basically, if we look at diabetic retinopathy, there are two eras or two epochs prior to 2016 and after 2016. So prior to 2016, there were uh, the, the positive predictive values were very low. And after 2016, the positive predictive values started improving a lot. And this thing, uh, so important studies, I won't go into too much details on that. Is one is uh, the INUC study, and then of course we talked of Ting at all. Now Ting was uh, this is uh, one of the landmark studies, which used four lakh ninety four thousand retinal images to train, and uh, it was using desktop conventional fundus camera photographs. INUC study was using uh, the IPAX telescreening system, and again they were traditional uh, desktop fundus photographs. Now. What has happened in more recent years is we've, we've, we've got uh, the Remedio experience where uh, funders on phone, the photographs, and, and the Indian ophthalmologists have a very big uh, contribution to making that an internationally accepted and acceptable project. And it's working on CNTK now, right? And then we had uh, the ISMOT, uh, the IART AI diabetic retinopathy. This, this started with only 296 patients. Then we had that one where we did, uh, you know, 10 lakh plus. Now, these are the landmark studies, Ramchandran, Abramov, Bhaskaran, Gulchin. And look at, this is the, the negative predictive value. All in the high 90s. These are 2018 ke baad ki studies. Hai ye. But still, look at the positive predictive values. They are on the low, lower side. So we are, this is still work in progress. Everybody will throw this data at you. This was, you know, the sensitivity, specificity, area under the curve was 90, 91, 97, 96. The point is, we are able to say no, we're not really able to say yes, so it is still work in progress. These are prior to that, and because smaller data sets were involved, again, we are looking at these. And now we have something called, uh, now, now what has happened is uh, certain governments have taken, uh, they have taken an initiative and they have decided that, you know, it, this needs to be licensed like we license the devices. Now this is what is coming, emerging from the US and they want the algorithms to be licensed like the medical devices are licensed. So now what we've done here is see, uh, the data was collected, the model was tuned, the model was validated. This is where everything is working, right? From there, it is going to come to... Then it comes to this. <laughs> On the live servers, it is live data, which, is, which goes into a deployed model, into model monitoring, and then whatever comes out of it is taken up for the green arrow for retraining this model, right? Yeah. Once we start retraining this model, now this, now look at this. So we have, the model is developed there. The first part is model development, then deployment, and after deployment, there is iterative improvement of the model. And we've all been involved in development of the models, and again we'll be involved in iterative improvement of those models. There have been a lot of... Uh, issues regarding you know the algorithms like uh, data which is prospective is better the, the, there is a difficulty in comparing the algorithms there are challenges related to machine learning process then this data is fitted to this data set is data set may say dusre data set ke upar matlab if it works in china does it work in india again is a big question and would require you know a lot of work so all this has to be taken into account then, of course, are the logistical difficulties, more so in a condition where we are talking in terms of, you know, the privacy concerns and anonymization. Then, of course, human barriers. Then is algorithmic interpretability. 
and then is these algorithms see they if it gets if the knowledge gets locked in one proprietary algorithm and is not able to be transferred to other then we are all going to lose out on whatever number of man hours we have spent in doing it so all those are very important and that is why we need a national uh, health artificial intelligence strategy which should cover all these things on top <clears throat> now based on the type of condition and the type of risk there is an there is a, a risk matrix so what they did was which which has been developed and they say that you see risk ranges from 1 to 4 and what you are trying to treat or what you are trying to diagnose and based on that risk and based on the return is how how the algorithms should be should be evaluated and at the same time they should be paid for so there is a risk and compensation analysis which is going on and uh, i think uh, there are other elements to it basically what we've tried to talk of is we talk whenever we talk of artificial intelligence we're just talking of you know this thing happening in diabetic retinopathy that thing happening in diabetic retinopathy so we we've, we've already demonstrated and we've already talked about what has been used there i have not gone into the details of the different studies which have taken place because that is uh, if if anybody is interested you can give me your mail ids i'll i'll, I'll forward complete tables there are around 96 studies and uh, only you know out of those 96 studies only one idx dr has made it to 